This rotating shelf is called a Lazy Susan. It was used to store and access flight index cards. And this is how airlines used to reserve tickets back in the 50s. An airline ticket agent would answer a phone call, find a card, check seats, check time, fill in the data, and issue a ticket. Each booking took an hour and a half. But things changed when American Airlines President C.R. Smith and IBM sales representative R. Blair Smith accidentally met on a flight from Los Angeles to New York in 1953. The History of Flight Booking The 1950s. In the post-war world, civil aviation is on the rise. Airplanes have just become a regular means of transportation, which means more passengers and more flights. The two largest aviation regulators, ICAO and IATA, are already shaping the rules in the increasingly congested skies. On the ground in the airline booking offices, things are no less busy. Airline agents are overwhelmed. They're trying to get flights booked using labor-intensive Lazy Susans. And this is when the two Smiths, chance travel companions on a flight to New York, are poised on the brink of making airline history. Their conversation resulted in a deal to develop a semi-automated business research environment, which became known simply as Sabre, the first airline central reservation system, CRS, that went live in 1964. 1960s. Built on two IBM 790 computers, Sabre allowed American Airlines to store digital information on flights and share it across operators. No blanks, no papers. With the help of Sabre, booking took a few minutes. But American wasn't the only airline. The advantage of Sabre created a demand for similar systems. To meet that demand, IBM developed a standardized CRS for multiple airlines across the US and Europe. So, after its launch in 1964, Sabre was followed by Panamac, System One, Apollo, and many other CRSs based on IBM's product. And by the late 70s, all major American and European carriers built their own systems. The automation of flight booking had begun. 1970s to 1980s. What was cool? The airlines could handle booking volumes with the help of CRSs. Sabre alone could process 84,000 transactions per day. The data exchange became a lot faster and easier. But there was another bottleneck, travel agencies. Here's how the booking worked. Imagine the process as a pipeline. A traveler calls an agency and is on hold while the agent is running through index cards and calling the airline. The airline operator uses a CRS to book a flight. Then the agent is back, passing the information to the traveler. To resolve the distribution bottleneck, two major airlines in the US open their CRSs to give travel agents access. During the mid-70s, Sabre and Apollo terminals appeared in travel agents' offices so now they could use command line interfaces to access flight information and book tickets. However, the terminal forced the agency to distribute only one airline. If you sell United, you can't sell American on the same terminal. Plus, the agency paid a commission for technical maintenance of terminals, and each booking made through it. A good deal? Hardly. A few years later, the growing airline industry was deregulated by the US government. Then fuel prices dropped. These were favorable conditions for new players to enter the airline industry. The number of airlines had grown, and it became profitable for CRS owners to let them into their systems. Distributors were no longer locked into one airline, as they could access multiple carriers, and airlines could compete in a digital market. But CRS owners were in the most advantageous position. By the early 80s, CRSs were charging both the agencies and other airlines to use their systems. And some, like American Airlines, even biased their system by placing American's fares first on the list, while charging its competitors a list fee and burying them lower on the list, which forced the other airlines to do the same. Game on. Questionable actions quickly destabilized the market, so governmental reaction was immediate. First, agency airline relations were regulated, and using a CRS for competitive advantage was now illegal. And by the end of the 80s, new regulations caused airlines to separate from CRSs, which became standalone businesses. These companies, now known as Global Distribution Systems or GDSs, define how the airline industry worked for years. 1990s. Meanwhile, the internet era had begun, and that meant airlines could finally sell their tickets online 
With the emergence of new technologies, airlines, GDSs, and software companies facilitated the development of the first booking tools and electronic commerce. In 1994, the first online closed booking engine, Easy Saber, was launched. Two years later, Saber founded the first online travel agency, Travelocity. Then Microsoft came in to establish Expedia the same year using data from WorldSpan GDS. Following the shift to a virtual marketplace, airlines began migration to electronic ticketing. Distribution cost via a website was as little as 25 cents compared to a traditional agency cost of eight bucks per booking. This fueled airlines and GDS interest in developing travel websites and online travel agencies. For instance, travel website Priceline, founded in 1997, was selling expiring tickets sourced from WorldSpan GDS. American, Northwest, Continental, and Delta founded Hotwire.com. 2000s. The world saw the two largest meta search engines, Kayak and Skyscanner, start their operations in 2004. The online market gradually formed as businesses either arose or collapsed. But more importantly, the travel market started consolidating. The first mobile travel application was released by Kayak in 2009 commencing the era of mobile devices. 2010s to today. Today, booking via smartphone is the norm, but it only gradually became part of a large travel experience system. Rather than offering one type of service per vendor, travel companies are hard at work to create products that deliver an all-in-one travel tool set. Think of Google with its maps flight notifications in Google, or flights shown on the Google search page as a minimum. Or Airbnb that basically allows you to book the whole trip within its adventures and experiences platforms. Another example is an announcement by Kiwi of its aspiration to become a global travel experience platform. The trend is vividly outlined. Travel corporations attempt to transform the travel experience from booking different products at different places to buying everything in one place and smartphones are the tools to make it happen. The long path through automation, deregulation, fuel-efficient planes, and more makes experiencing the world cheaper and simpler than ever before. And the access to entire trips sits there in your pocket.